dear friends this is a kind of venture i am making keeping some school kids in mind who are in class 9th or 10th also some grown up adults who have heard the term euclidean geometry read it in class 9th and 10th gave their exams maybe scored very well but really have not known what euclidean geometry was really all about and who was euclid and what did he really do and why his name lingers on even after 2000 years in mathematics that is the question that uh, we need to really think about and as i go along this little series that i'll start a few lecture few few shows um youtube uh, talks in which i would tell you that uh, it is one of the greatest bane on the education system here maybe in the world that we don't really talk about euclid even to students who are really interested in mathematics euclid and his famous book euclid's elements euclid wrote 13 books and all these 13 books which was in in obviously in greek or latin and i think it's they were uh, translated into english and published by dover publication and all the 13 has been combined into three useful volumes so the first volume contains book 1 and book 2 is called euclid's element and it has been uh, translated by sir thomas l heath a historian of mathematics and then comes book this is volume 2 it consists from book 3 to book 9 euclid's book books doesn't only cover geometry it covers a lot about numbers so it here it contains book 10 to book 13 and there's a lot about in this third volume which is never done in never ever taught in our school nowadays is solid geometry and when we don't talk about geometry in the euclid geometry in space three dimensional space we do a great disservice to even to people who want to go and study mathematics in the future because their geometrical visualization doesn't become clear and and because of this geometrical visual visualization not been clear and not been understanding how things look very different in two dimension and in three dimension for example two dimension these are parallel lines but three dimension which will call which you call sometimes skew parallel this can be also considered as parallel lines so there is a difference in the way you view things and as a result you have to uh, be really conversant with solid geometry if you want a deeper understanding of geometry that we later on learn about projective geometry or affine geometry or maybe differential geometry see the idea today is not to tell you much but to talk about the book one of euclid we when we think we study euclidean geometry the first thing that we think oh we must be studying whatever is written in euclid's books if we are told in the class that euclid wrote wrote 13 such books and one of the famous results of number theory that the number of primes are infinite all all of us knows that num- a prime is a number which is divided by itself and one right these are the only two factors it has and that they they are infinite in number that was proved in euclid's element in those days so uh, euclid's book is not just about geometry or plane geometry that we have learned in school it consists of number theory plane geometry and solid geometry so it's a very big very big uh, tome on mathematics one of the finest ever even in the western world they basically say that along with the bible the most famous book of the western world is possibly euclid's elements of course here in india there were very famous geometers who knew lot about the things and much more than what was there in euclid's geometry uh, there is is sometimes a tendency to think that we had not done anything in india i would bring up one name and i later on sometimes i'll try to talk to you about brahmagupta the court mathematician in ujjain and his theorems are amazingly startling and brahmagupta's theorems comes up in books written by very famous modern western geometers it is extremely unfortunate we do not talk about his beautiful theorems in our school curriculum 
it is extremely unfortunate if i have to choose my geometrical hero in india i will definitely choose brahmagupta so let us let me tell you what euclid did euclid actually organized mathematics he said that you cannot just be empirically doing things without proofs because empirical means you prove something for 100 cases and 101 case it fails so it is not holding for every case he wanted to get a get things which will hold either hold for every case or won't hold for every case so he formalized the idea of a mathematical proof what we will see in his first book book 1 he started by talking about certain basic definitions of things he gives 23 definitions and then he talks about five postulates and certain common notions which you and i can understand and then he writes his proposition he never writes the word theorem it's always proposition it's kind of a state mathematical statement he proposes and he wants to show the proof now let me just read from the book of this if you ever have a copy of this book i i i knew that you played wrote 13 books it's only when i became a faculty myself i had enough money to buy these books which i treasure and uh, i i sometimes take a look at them and sometimes wonder why i was not taught these at school such a beautiful thing it it is almost high art and i can tell you that there are many results here which when given to a, a school child he might just fumble it might be very difficult to him so elementary always doesn't mean easy you you need less material but it might be pretty challenging so let me come to book 1 okay in book 1 what he first does is he talks about definition this book that if you have a buy look at it 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 tells you a lot of things he, he, there's a commentary he, they write what he has written that english translation then gives a commentary i know current generation students would get bored to talk about a commentary i am not expecting you to bother about commentaries i am just giving you few thing a point is that which has no part a line is a breathless length the extremities of lines are points a straight line is a line which lies evenly with points on itself you might be thinking what he is doing is beating about the bush okay you take a point here is a point you can see here is a point and here is a line and here is something which i call right angle and a circle now you you have a look at it you can very well understand point pop the point however when i finally want to draw it will have an area a line would also have a breadth right angle it's very difficult to get an idea of this what is a right angle because you really do not know what an angle is there so he talks about plane angle first a plane angle is the inclination of inclination to one another of two lines in a plane which meet one another and do not lie in a straight line something like this which you understand but you have to understand during euclid's time there was no measurement of angles there was no degrees no radian measure nothing they came much later so they don't tell that find so and so angle if this is this plus this plus this the sum of three angles of a triangle is 180 degree no no that's not the theorem the sum of three angles of a triangle lying on a plane is two right angles that is what euclid's theorem is so we will come to that later and there are many thing he talks about obtuse angle acute angle what is a boundary what is a figure Uh, what is a equilateral triangle what is an isosceles triangle uh, so for example of trilateral figures he doesn't call them triangles we call them triangles uh, in, in english translation we write them triangles so they call it trilateral means three lines are involved so of trilateral figures an equilateral triangle is that which has three sides equal isosceles triangle is that which has two sides alone equal and a scalene triangle is that which has all the three sides on equal so it gives all these definitions you know he talks about right angle triangle and all all those tri- um, obtuse angle triangle and acute angle triangle all all these things you can you when you keep on doing jo- those who have done school geometry this is all in your mind you don't have to be reminded what are what are them so in reality these things a point line triangle right angle triangle let us let me see what he talks about right angle triangle you see 
and when line containing angles are straight they are called rectilinear okay when a straight line set up on a straight line makes an adjacent angle equal to one another each of the angles is right is right and the straight line standing on the other is called perpendicular on that on which it stands so you can very well understand what he what he means by that so these are certain things which i and you can also understand and I, you can have a complete feel of what he is telling in reality these things are so within our intuitive grasp that we don't really define it in a modern geometry you wouldn't just go ahead and define so we will have certain objects which i and you understand what are these we are not going to get into what are they structurally how they look like we will then provide a set of rules or axioms which some euclid calls postulates hmm. that this is what i expect them to follow and i have tried them out and seen that they follow this any object which follows those rules can be called as a line point circle right angle whatever it need not be exactly that geometrical object this is where this exactly what i have spoken now this is where i moved from school elementary thinking to a higher axiomatic method of thinking what euclid did he organized mathematics into axiom into some uh, notions which are undefined notions then into axioms and then propositions so this structure of mathematics is retained till date this is how modern mathematics is done so for example say in set theory what is a set i and you understand fairly well what a set is but there is no real definition of a set pinpointed structurally this is what means a set other things are not a set so we we cannot make such definitions here for example you draw a point however fine it might be it will have a area actually it will be a two dimensional it will have a two dimensional area on this plane it might be very very small doesn't matter but it has it's not zero point is something which doesn't have anything no length no breadth no height nothing so what is that that's so abstract you can't really go and think that there is something like that which has no parts so you can really understand what he is talking about is an idealistic view of certain things which i and you understand so it's things in the limit those who understand calculus they can say that okay these are things in the limit they don't really you can make draw lines smoother and finer and finer and finer you're going more and more near the idealistic line but such lines don't exist in reality how can you have a draw line which has no really no length no breadth however small however small that breadth might be it's not zero so never mind so these are things i and you understand now let us see what are the postulates so let me see what are the postulate the five postulate postulates are you to draw a straight line from any point to any point so if there are two points on the plane the euclid's plane euclid's plane is something he imagines a plane like a pa paper there's a piece of paper and this piece of paper is extended on all sides and he imagines that he extended infinitely the idea of infinity is already there in his head but he doesn't express it the question of course is you can say that do i find such a thing on earth no on earth surface you cannot find because the earth surface is round so you, this plane is also in your imagination that there is this extended infinitely this plane and then like for example if you look at a railway line you know parallel lines parallel lines are the ones which are drawn on the plane but they do not meet so you look at that railway line and it goes and it goes and goes and you just see that they almost possibly meet at very one and very far off distance that's the kind of view one makes but you don't see you don't see a curvature there you don't see that okay it just falls off the rail line doesn't fall off so within your eye limit what you can see is in planar in structure has is a plane like structure or not so that is why this idea of a plane geometry works so well when we are building making a building building bridges you do building mechanical things because they are within our visual range we are doing things within our visual range and within that euclid's geometry works perfectly well euclid is a true hero so what if us says that okay let us this is the plane so draw a straight line from any point to any point okay you can draw take take two points and join them by a straight line that's it to produce a finite line continuously in a straight line 
So you have a finite line, means a line segment actually. Those who know some mathematics, they'll know what I'm talking is about line segment. So you take two points, join them, but you can extend them in, indefinitely on both sides. See how subtle the whole thing is. The idea of infinity is built in, but it is never expressed. And right. To describe a circle with center and a distance, when you can always draw a circle with a center and a given radius, you can always draw that. All right angles are equal to each other, of course. That is essentially what the definition says, that if they are standing and both the angles are equal to each other, then right, they are, one of, each of them is called a right angle. The fifth postulate, which has led in the future, of many years after Euclid, in eighteenth in the, in the nineteenth century, into what is called a huge revolution in geometry, and that new revolution showed us that the geometry of the world is really not Euclidean, and that is what Albert Einstein used in his theory of relativity, general relativity. It says if a straight line falling on two straight lines makes an interior angles on the same side less than two right angles. The two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side, which are which are the angles less than two right angles. So he is talking about a very strange scenario. He is talking about this scenario. So he is saying there are two straight lines. Okay, so let me again read it. The, and if a straight line falling on two straight lines, so there, he, so there. Are this is the, the the one which is crossing you know this one this is this line this line is cutting two straight lines falling on two straight lines and in the side where the sum of the two adjacent angles means the one which i have marked those angles they their sum is less than in your parlance it will be 180 degrees sum is less than two right angles then if the side the lines is extended on that particular side we'll finally meet now it might look obvious to you but it's really not obvious to a mathematician it seems he talks about you might say okay you, anyway he has defined what is adjacent angle on the 23 definitions uh, and of course he talks about right angles so i can i should talk about two right angles but i cannot visualize what two right angles is people thought that can i prove this postulate five from the remaining axioms, people tried and tried and tried and tried, and they couldn't. Then some brave people decided, very brave people, like Lovacheveski in Russia, like Jonas Bolai in Hungary, Karl Federich Gauss, Bernard Riemann, they decided that this fifth postulate seems to be independent of the fourth postulate. I can possibly think about a geometry without the fifth postulate or have something which is very different than the fifth postulate and have a geometry as consistent and as rigorous as Euclid's. In Euclid's elements, still the 28th proposition it doesn't use this fifth postulate. Fifth postulate comes in from the 29th proposition. There is a simple way of the, this fifth postulate is told to you in your class. That in a plane, if you take a straight line, and if you take a point outside the straight line, through that point, only one and only one line can be drawn, which is parallel to this given line. This is called the Playfair's axiom or Playfair's uh, representation of the fifth postulate. But nobody could ever prove the fifth postulate wrong. Neither they could prove it from the other axioms. So geometries came up which were called non-Euclidean geometries where people decided what happens if I have more than one, that was Lobachevsky's game, if I have more than one line parallel through a given point, through a given point, through, um, through a given point and parallel to a given line. So, so there is a line and a point outside it. Lovacheviski said through this point, I'll assume two lines which are parallel to this line. I am not bothered. I am not telling that the my working theater is the Euclidean plane. I am telling that okay, 
I am in, I'm, I am somewhere in some space and in, in that particular space, I would have uh, I would have a straight line. I'll define I, the, the straight line can be defined as a line as things I need stop joining two points on that in that particular uh, the working theater. And then I'll take a point in and through that point I'll I'll think that there are two lines parallel to this particular straight line, which is in defiance to the fifth postulate. But a consistent geometry can be made up with that definition, which led to what is called hyperbolic geometry and one type of non Euclidean geometry. And it's still a very active area of research and has applications. So, I am almost ending the story today. I am telling just one observation of Euclid, which he couldn't prove either, led to a whole bunch of revolution. This is the true story of Euclidean geometry. Nobody can ever prove the fifth postulate wrong on the Euclidean plane, on Euclid's plane. No, you can't do that. Euclid's geometry is a pure art form. We will, in this series called Euclid and his Elements, we will actually tell you about several nice results from Euclid, starting from results about plane geometry to solid geometry, so that you know what a great work this was and proposition 47 in book one is your all all of us is the favorite pythagoras theorem favorite to many of us but please understand that even in the first proposition of euclid the logic of its proof can be challenged in modern terms so a book which looks absolutely beautiful and absolutely complete may not truly be so. But never mind. There are many hidden assumptions when you are doing the proof. You would, never, you would also possibly not realize. Many proofs are just picture based. But there is hardly a book as beautiful as the Euclid's element in mathematics. So thank you. Hope you enjoyed this first starting. We will talk about Euclid's proposition 1 and proposition 2 proposition 2 is not so easy to prove by the way in the next session in the next session on geometry this session would be called euclid and his, ele and his elements thank you very much